Hi, Edwin. How are you? I'm doing good. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, absolutely. And you're in the nice sunshine outside. Is it cool or is it warm? It is nice outside. It's uh, trying to get away from the kids <laughs> for a little bit. You know, so let me start by asking you uh, a question. Um, can you tell us your name? Tell us a little bit about you. Give us some sense of who you are so we can get to know you as we, we, we begin this discussion. Yeah. Um, well, my name is Edwin Molina. I am uh, I'm 47. I, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Uh, my parents are both living in the island and they are immigrants from Colombia, South America. Uh, I, I grew up in that immigrant experience in, to a certain degree. I have been with my wife since 1994. She's a hyper intelligent, hyper kind woman. She is a pediatrician. She worked in clinical for 15 years, always uh, helping the, those who needed, not only for children, but she worked with immigrants, with the poor rural areas. She have done uh, relief for Haiti during the earthquakes, physically traveling there, uh, always giving everything for herself to all others. We have four children, ages 19, 14, 12 and a half, and yesterday six. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> uh, professionally speaking, I've been in IT. Uh, I work for Duke Recreation and Physical Education as their IT specialist. I've been in Duke for three years. I've been in IT for uh, 23 years, 22 years. But my former education is as a marine biologist. And I work as a biologist for a while. It's my, my hidden secret. Oh. <laughs> I, during those uh, years, I have, we have moved a lot because of my wife. When she finished um, her, her studies, she went to med school in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Then we moved to uh, Naples, Florida, so she could work in Muckley. Uh, eventually, we moved to Fort Myers. We moved to Elizabeth City, North Carolina. We moved back to Panama City, Florida. Uh, and eventually, we're here. Uh, I, during those moves, I always have to change a job. And my role have been trying to be supportive of, you know, the endeavors. Uh, and I've been exposed to a lot of places and people that are very interesting. I work as a private consultant. I work for medical offices, for lawyers. Uh, I work for federal government, state government, private entities, mega corporations, national, international. I, before working for Duke, I work as an IT specialist for the Lee County Sheriff's Office. Interesting, that's a very, very profound uh, uh, life uh, with all the travel and all the different jobs you've had, but, but, but you've made it every time, you, you, you keep persevering. Yes. Yes, that's a, uh, I laugh because I, I, I talk a lot with my wife and, and, and my eldest daughter now that she's an adult and she sees the world a different. Uh, and we always say that, you know, I feel like we're nomads. Uh, the way that my wife likes to put it is like we're citizens of the world, but I just go, we're nomads. <laughs> we just migrate. And when we move to Durham, I, I plead. It's like, I don't want to move. <laughs> I don't want to move ever again. And since we have been in Durham, we have moved already once. <laughs> It's, uh, it, it is hard. Uh, Moving is taxing. Yeah. Uh, on, on my life, personally speaking, I have been blessed with many things because when I have experienced uh, racism or discrimination, I, I joke that I'm stupid enough not to notice mm -hmm. until years later. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I don't know if it's because my parents, being immigrants uh, in Puerto Rico, they didn't have the language barrier. They were documented, but they were always treated as outsiders, as the exotic novelty. Mm -hmm. uh, they always embedded all his hard work. Mm -hmm. My father has his own business, which he's 75 and still keeps it. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. <laughs> and he fights even in this economy. And uh, they always said, you know, the problem is not school. The problem is that you, you something, it's you. Right. And oh, you don't have materials, then go build some. You know, that's build it. And for us, and my children, I always joke about it, but for us, second place in school was first place loser. Yeah. There's, there's no 98, not good enough. Great. You did an A, 99. What did you miss? What did you learn? And so for us as a family, that's how it's been to strive. And we carry that. This is not the place where we grew up, like Durham, even when I love it. But that means that I have to provide for my children, try to increase that opportunity and poke and probe everywhere and see, you know, what they can do. And there's always a, an inherent fear that, oh, we may lose all the great things that we have, like all the access to all the good resources. I'm always thriving. And then it's like, yeah, I don't know if I leave, you know, I'm never going to have all this. I better absorb it. Yeah. yeah. I, I think when I first met you in uh, Diversify IT, I found you a very profound man with very profound experiences. And so it was very important that I talk to you. But I'll tell you a little side story. If you, I have two children. Um, an older daughter and a, and a son that just turned 21. And my, if my daughter ever tells you a story, if you ever get to meet her, she's gonna tell you that she was never allowed to get anything other than an A. And from, from the first day she went to school to when she did her last college, she's been just exceptionally brilliant and always gets an A, whereas my son, I just wanna pass. You know, so and she's always fussing at me, mom, you made me get A's, how come you're not doing this to him? So. Uh, I understand your pain. I feel your pain, you know, for that. But, but, but back to the topic, you know, so some of the things you've shared with us in Diversify IT of being a man on an island by yourself, not having much support, has that been the case throughout your life or is that just unique to do? Well, to put it in context, what I was saying is that Recreation and physical location is a magnificent place to work. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I am fortunate that I do not share a lot of the harsh experiences that a lot of you have shared, mm -hmm. especially with racial, you know, profiling or discrimination uh, and that feeling of isolation. Uh, our director is, uh, some people say that she's a unicorn because she's an African-American uh, woman, Felicia Tittle, and she is one of the few who lead a recreation facility in the United States. Yeah. Uh, there are just a handful, if, if that many. So culturally, our program has always focused on diversity and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And through all the years, that management, Felicia has surrounded with people that understand and, and see. Uh, but IT is new for recreation itself. We're part of athletics, and the director of IT, uh, uh, Lori, she's an incredibly smart woman. She's passionate. She's, she's, she's awesome, but she has to take care of athletics. So for us, it's like Felicia said, no, we need somebody. And I was lucky enough to be chosen. And I said that I don't drink the Kool-Aid. I bathe on it. And my mission is to help everybody in rec. But in terms of IT, I'm alone. So I don't have a coworker to bounce ideas or things. Um, I'm smart and I'm capable and I bring a lot of knowledge and experience. So my staff brings stuff to me, which is what they need to do. But it's like the box stops here. So when I joined Diversify IT was with the initial mental thought, oh, I'm going to go and help women be participant of this IT world. And the first thing, it's uh, I got smack in the head. No, no, no. I'm the one that needs help. 
And people in diversified IT actually figured out that I'm an innovator. I like to innovate. That's my thing. It's not that it's computers or network or security. It's that it's innovation. It could be anything. Cupcakes. And then I start realizing what I can do. And through all the little tests and programs that I'm helping facilitate in REC, I was trying to put women in positions of power to teach these young students what a woman in IT needs to be treated as, as an equal, and have them with responsibilities and hearing their voices, and using all the techniques that I've been learning on how to empower women in a meeting room, which I don't have, and that way they, they have something. Hey, if the crazy guy in REC did it, this is what it needs to do, this is what my peers are experiencing and, and try. And, and in terms of IT, when I go to OIT, for example, I have colleagues like you that I can approach and they will give me feedback, they will give me support, but as an institution, I'm outside. Like OIT as a, management, as a managerial entity had never gone into like, you know, Edwin, I understand that you are the support for REC, and we are glad that you know and that you are willing to do all this stuff. Thank you. If you ever need to come to the building, you know, your batch will work. Literally, I have to start calling people. Hey, I, I just want to say hello to my coworkers. It's lunchtime and I happen to be in your campus. It can't happen. Uh, if, for example, I notice a, a letter circulating that has technical material that is nice for me to grow, I need to have somebody pull it out and give it to me. I mean, it's not even private information. So uh, at some point, I'm like, you know, I'm alone. Sometimes I go talk to Lori, and she's super gracious and give me give me some feedback. And sometimes I go to colleagues, but it's it's, it's an uphill battle. And it's just because of the way that the university is structured itself in terms of IT. Yeah. So let me ask you a question, and this may be an uncomfortable question, and you can certainly choose not to answer it. Do you consider yourself ethnically brown, or how do you, what, what ethnicity do you dis decide, decide that you are, you declare that you are? Yeah, that, that is very interesting. Um, I always say, and I consider myself Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. uh, with Colombian parents. Uh, I identify myself as being brown. Mm -hmm. But I understand clearly that I have the privilege that my skin is of a lighter tone mm -hmm. and I blend really well in group photos. Mm -hmm. uh, when I open my mouth or I start talking, I talk with my hands and my English still after 20 years is not as good as it should be and people notice. If I get excited, I may switch to Spanish. If I get really angry, I speak only in Spanish. Mm -hmm. And I am always mindful that culturally, I am different. Yes. Um, especially in race. I mean, for, for if you see a, a person that lives in Puerto Rico, that grows in the island, they consider themselves Puerto Ricans. But they say, I am white, I am brown, I'm black. Mm -hmm. If you take the same person that grew in the island and move them to the United States and they have been 10, 20 years here, like me, they say, I'm Puerto Rican, I'm Latino. But they don't put that ethnicity because culturally speaking, in the United States, we are on this bracket. You are brown, you speak Spanish, you're dumb, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, in a, and in Puerto Rico, there is racism. And that's one of the things that I have been tackling with myself in terms for the last few years, but especially now when talking to all of you that my micro biases are different, but they exist. Mm -hmm. For example, in Puerto Rico, there's a lot of animosity, culturally speaking, against Dominicans because they're in the next island. Mm -hmm. And Dominicans have it to Haitians. We are on the same island, but in the other side, and so on. You see people from Venezuela, and they say, oh, you are from X or Y, Latin American country. You are nothing. And in the same island, uh, in Puerto Rico, there is a, a municipality, Loiza, 
that is have 30,000 people. So it's a, it's a town and around 80% of the population are black with direct connections to the purest ancestry in Africa. They, for some reason, they have not mixed and the African inspire poetry, history, music, like Bomba and Plena, we're born there. And we are Puerto Ricans, we, we hear that. And it, it, it excites us and, and it's touching. But even themselves, sometimes they segregate. So we as Puerto Ricans, we have a problem with segregation. We have a problem with race. And it is hypocritical for somebody like me that lives in the United States says, oh, we have it okay in Puerto Rico. No, we don't. I live here. And rather than me focusing now on saying like, oh, the Hispanic problem, the, the, the macho culture, the misogynistic impulses, or, or the documented versus undocumented, that, that to me, at this moment of time, I have realized that it is an important fight, but we need to fight for the black community because our house is is flooded and it's falling apart but the one from african americans in the united states it's on fire and it's collapsing and people are actually dying yeah. uh so when people scream at me names and it has happened it, it's, it's hurtful but but i'm alive <laughs> when somebody screams name in a situation to an african-american that is life threatening yeah. so we need to go and say, okay, there's a lot of problems in all places, but let's focus on the big one, the biggest one that, it, that also affects people in Puerto Rico, in Mexico, Colombia, Latin America, but also in Europe, in the UK, in Germany, but also in Africa, South Africa, Egypt. And then we can say, you know, we also have issues with Asians. And then the Asians can say, hey, you know, we have also people from Korea and Japan being antagonistic against each other because they're different. So we can use the example of the solutions that we figured out how we resolve our crisis, our crimes against humanity, against African-Americans as an example of the path to follow. Okay, we did that with them. That was the hardest one. The other ones are real, not as bad. So we need to be able to solve them. And I think that that's a powerful message I learned from my wife and my daughter that we need as Hispanics to, to propagate and to say, I'm not saying that your, your problem as whatever is not important. You are queer and it's bad and I am your ally, but let's pick up all our energy, solve one huge problem and then we'll tackle the other ones. So let me ask you this question. There was a, 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 I think it was a book, it may have eventually, eventually became a movie called uh, What Colors Your Abuelo? Uh, um, and uh, it's been a long, long time since I've seen it or read it. And I don't remember whether it was a movie or a book. I can't remember right off the top of my head. But the point that, the, the, that was made is that the lighter your skin, the better you are, and specifically in Latino populations. Is that still a realism today? Yes. And the correct phrase is, and it's basically your grandma, where is she? Mm -hmm. and, and it's because there's a duality that for us, since we were kids, we were taught in Puerto Rico. You come from three places, Mother Africa, Mother Spain, and the Taino, the Aborigine. And you have the back of all three. You are beautiful like Africans. You are dedicated like Spaniards. And you're gentle like the Taino. But the reality of things, it is not demonstrated. Because then you see the countries that we see in the United States, the continental. And that you see in Hawaii. And that you see in Alaska about those minorities. It's like, same thing, job application. Once you see it, oh, you're black, maybe not you. Why? See the credentials. Or in schooling. Or it's like we say, 
Todos tenemos una nariz chata. Everybody has a, a flattened nose. Because that's the thing. It's, 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 it's what is it? In my side, like for example, my mother's, my mother's, uh, my grandmother, from my mother's side, she she was same tone as you. It was black, and my grandfather was white, like blue eyes, and it was normal. He was so aberrant in his community that everybody knew him because he had blue eyes, yeah. and so that's that's part of the ancestry I brain. But also, I bring other places, my children, from my, from my wife's side. So you see a lot of disparity. And there's a lot of waking up that is happening, uh, like the Black Lives Matter marches that have been happening in Puerto Rico. They are specifically saying, this is our problem. This is not happening in Minnesota or in Los Angeles or in Mars. It's happening here in the island. Look at your brother beside you. You're doing the same thing. If you think that that atrocity that happened in Minnesota and everywhere else, like in Tulsa and everywhere else, it's not, it just happened to the people in the continental United States, you were wrong. It happened here. And they named the cases one by one. All the things you see all the, the, the ones, the police abuse. So you are correct. And that's the thing that I bring to my fellow that look like me, Latinos, that may not think like me, and say like, what's your ancestry? Because you may be one generation removed from your color and your kids may be completely black because you carry the genes. And now what? And if it's unfair for them, it has to be unfair to you. Period. I, no. I, I, I don't know people, people in, in, I don't know, in Ohio, but if the injustice happened there, it has to affect me personally, and I have to scream, this is unfair. Yeah. Let, let me ask you a question. This is something that has always been perplexing to me. Um, for the longest time, um, people from uh, Spanish-speaking countries were considered Hispanics. And as of late, we've changed that to Latinos or Latinx. What's the difference between Hispanic and Latino? I think that the best way to describe it is that Hispanic comes from, uh, from basically the language. And Latino, it includes all Latin America, including Brazil, and the other countries that reflect the same culture of colonization. Like, you cannot say that, you could, literally, you could say that Jamaicans are Latino. Their experience is different because they're colonized because they're British, and they speak English, but they have the same African roots that people from Mexico have, or Nicaragua, but they speak English. So the experience is different. Um, the term Latinx, to me, it's a hard thing to say because in Spanish, words have gender, like, um, I don't know, carro ends with O, so it's a male thing. <laughs> and silla, hair, is ends with A, so it's female. So when we say Latino, we mean everybody. But I understand how the evolution is. If we say Latino, speaking about everybody, we are excluding women, and that should not be the case. Okay. So it, it, it's, it's hard for me to always get in the mentality because I'm old. <laughs> but I, I, I understand that, you know, especially Latinos, we have to put women first because that is a big issue for us. Yeah, thank you. And, and since you've been in, in North Carolina, specifically Durham, have you experienced uh, discrimination, racism, microaggression, name calling, any of those kinds of things that are meant to make people feel small? Um. I would say yes, but nothing terrible. Uh, 
especially like when when we are with the family and we decide to go to a place and my wife and I are speaking in Spanish or we're joking with the kids and trying to teach them the language or we do something and we're allowed, you know, you get the looks, you get the first clutching, the, I call it the Olympic street walk to the other corner. Uh, when we go to like a Hispanic restaurant and then, you know, they greet us in English, which is the proper thing to do because you're welcoming and we answer in Spanish. Then we get the, the ah, sights. But to me, that perpetuates that division. But then we see the, the people that are not Hispanics there feeling uncomfortable, like I am violating your space. And that is completely the opposite. Um, I have seen it, you know, um, you know, um, when I'm go shopping or do something that somebody's looking at me, kind of like watching what I'm doing, especially like if I'm talking. <laughs> I mean, if I'm quiet and, you know, keep my hands out of the visible and do my thing, you know, it's good. But if there's a confrontation, an altercation around me, you know, I always keep a focus on what is this guy doing. Very good. So um, are you afraid for yourself, for your family, or your relatives uh, to uh, interact with the larger society? And I mean, when I say fear, fear of death, fear of being arrested, fear of being attacked, um, some some physical harm to your person. Yeah, I would say yes. If I have to say yes or no, and 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 especially my children, because they they don't know the rules of engagement that we have to. And like my parents never sit down with me to have a talk. I learned it when I went to the US for the first time. I went to do my bachelor's in Texas. And I remember the first time somebody, they were, they were mad about something and they called me a went back and said, a bunch of people. And I literally look at my friend and I was like, what is this wet back? <laughs> and then they say, no, that's a derogatory thing. The people that cross illegally through the river. I'm going, like, oh no, no, I'm not a wet back. I flew here. But this is really far away. And I never realized he was racist. But my children, they they grew up here. So when somebody calls them names or they profile them, especially when immigration and and Hispanic issues are out, they're gonna go naturally trying to defend, not knowing that they have a target. Mm -hmm. Like my kids they wanna ride a bike and I'm like, yeah. You know, he can go out of the corner, and they think I'm crazy. And and my wife says, no, 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 we we may go outside, but it's it's not here. Like I don't know if somebody will look at them, and then you know, I mean, they tell me go to my country. I'm like, I'm in Puerto Rico, I'm an American citizen. My birth. What are you talking about? I mean, there's no difference. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I fear not constantly like. What I know and I hear from African American parents, but when there is a lot of civil unrest, when there was this all this talk about deportation and immigration, uh, and especially my elder, she she she's young, so she's an activist, and she goes and all those things. When my wife says, you know, we need to march, we need to go and join, you know, this, and she goes, part of me is afraid, but. But it's nothing compared to the to the uh, African American experience. There, there, there's there's no way it's gonna be the same. We only have about three minutes left, and I want to ask you one question, and then I'll leave the last two two minutes to you to say whatever you want to say. So um, uh, last year um, we saw a lot of uh, people coming from Spanish speaking countries. Uh, put in cages and isolated at borders. What were your thoughts about that and, and, and what actions did you take, if any? <laughs> it is so horrible. It, it reminds me when I was reading about World War II concentration camps. And then reading about 
the things that we did with Japanese Americans here in our school. It reminds me of when I worked for the church, I used to work supporting the 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 jail and one of my sections that I had filed was the GED and the aimers would look at me and try to shake my hands to thank and and how dehumanizing that is. Those actions created a generation of people who be hurt, angry, without the tools to progress. So these are the people that, that is the answer why they're riots now. You have a child who you profile and you pressure into, you are seen, you are in a shop, you're browsing. You're telling that, you know, oh, you are given things entitled, but the reality is that you may not have food or health care. And, um, and then eventually they can't take it anymore and they're screaming for a fresh air breath, for an opportunity that's fair. And suddenly they have to unleash this anger. I mean, we did it in the Boston Tea Party. How many decades they were asking for equal rights and representation? And, uh, and eventually we exploded. So this, they are creating human bombs and it will take a lot of resources to take off that drama out of their souls. Um, what I did, you know, we, through my wife, again, she's an, an amazing leader, you know, helping with March, talking with people, um, sharing some resources. I mean, trying to talk to people in the island. And it, 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 is, it is not funny, but kind of like ironic when they were saying like, well, those are people who are undocumented. And then Hurricane Maria happened. And literally the president of the United States goes there to throw paper towels. And my parents, personally, they spend three months without potable water, 11 months without power. Wow. And there were not the last ones. There were people, the last one was 19 months. Wow. And these are American citizens. What? <laughs> out of sight, out of mind. So we're putting people in cages because they have nowhere to go. And we don't give them a path. There's not a rubric saying, okay, if you want to immigrate, this is what you have to do. One, two, three. No, we say, you have to be legal, but you don't. My parents, they follow a legal process, and it took them 32 years to become American citizens. Wow. And they were randomly investigated by the IRS four times. What? <laughs> and, and it's time. Paying taxes, doing things, obeying the law. My parents have never been arrested, never have done anything, doing charity work, asking, following the process, making the line, waiting. Do you know? And they never knew when it was going to happen. Wow. So why are you expecting somebody to come here and have to live in fear that I may be removed and my children will be orphaned. Or like the veterans, the case of the veterans, they, 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 they came in illegally, they grew up here, they went to serve, they went to Iraq, they had two or three tours, they come in, they have PTSD, they get in a bar fight, and they are deported because they're illegal, and they're sent to Mexico, and they're like, I don't even speak Spanish. I left, I left Mexico when I was free. I was removed. And now they have been there alone, abandoned. I mean, safe or free, respect your military, regardless of how you feel. I mean, come on, that's a, that's a human crisis. Yeah. So the fact that we have the person with the spotlight, dehumanizing everybody, not only Hispanics in the borders, but Hispanics on daily work, African Americans in their daily lives, professionals, Lying and then pretending that nothing happened. It is outrageous. Yeah. So you were right. You know, those all those things are intricate and they're they're connected. Yeah. I will tell you when uh when they started uh 
uh, capturing people coming into the America to the border and they were separating parents from children, it brought me back to slavery because that's exactly what happened to black people or enslaved people. When slavery began, children could be sold, sold away from their parents. They could have been, you know, any number of things could happen. And so when I was looking at that, you know, I was thinking to myself, you know, we we'll just keep repeating history over and over again, you know, so whatever we can do to make sure that black and brown people do not get an advantage, we do. One of my colleagues said to me, um, he read somewhere that by 2030, uh, black and brown people will be the majority and there will be no more pluralism for whites. Um, and I think that's a very interesting uh, context considering that if that is indeed correct, will we have the tools to lead a world where we've been shunned and made small for hundreds and hundreds of years? Wow. That's a very powerful thought. Well, Edwin, we have uh, one minute, so I'm give, give you the floor. I do want to tell you, you are a member of T Tex and Collab, so you have a family or a community. We are there to help you in whatever we can. I'm glad you are a member of Diversify IT, and they're also a community for you. But what Tex and Collabs do really, really well is we help each other when we encounter wicked problems. We talk with each other, and every once in a while we talk about diversity, but for the most part, our work is just trying to help each other solve some of the IT problems that we cannot find through normal channels. So I leave this minute to you, whatever you wish to say. Well, I think that uh, my personal, from my personal journey, especially the last few weeks, I think that the, what I would like to share is talk to somebody that looks like you, but don't think exactly like you. Don't go to the echo chamber. I mean, if you're a woman and you talk about women issues with only women, we men are not going to learn. Uh, you know, find people that love you or that respect you professionally and bring it and nudge gently but uncomfortable. And that way they can bring in. Some people are afraid of talking because they don't want to offend, or they say, you know, I, I am not the perpetrator of this horrible act. I am not promoting them, but I don't want to take the power from others. And we all have a little to blame in some port. We all have privilege, depending on the situation. And we all have to analyze what we're doing. So when you engage in that uncomfortable moment, then people know, okay, this person means well, let, let's engage. And then you find the ones who are brave. Then you see the ones that are allies. And then after you engage that, feel and commit yourself, pledge yourself to somebody. Like I did to you, you know, I pledge my, 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 my strength, my life to you. I will invest something you have to do. But I also tell you to train and other people. Yeah. And that is the commitment. And then it's like, okay, what am I doing to make sure that when I'm judged by those people I play, just said, yeah, he moves. I may not be as strong as Martin Luther King, Martin S, Gandhi, or Mother Teresa, and be in the front of the march, but I can talk to 10 people. I can talk to 20 people. I can lead by example. I can be myself vulnerable. And that's what I would like people to figure out that when they're vulnerable, even if somebody mocks them, they're planting the seed and it will germinate and help. Well, thank you so much for this talk today. I will send you a copy of the recording. You can watch it and tell me if you agree that it can be uploaded. And if not, we will not. But if so, we will. I'm very grateful for you. I'm glad that I know you. I'm glad that you become a part of my community. And I think you are a phenomenal man. And so thank you very much for doing this with me. And then uh, when are you going to teach me how to speak Spanish? En cualquier día, puedo empezar ahora mismo. Gracias. Thank Gracias you. Gracias a todos. Stay safe. Bye, you too. Bye-bye.